day is that's what cities do. There have been humans of several species for millions of years, but through most of that time they existed beyond the reach of history. You can tell some of the places where they were because their fires baked the ground beneath them into low-grade ceramics. So we know something about their habits, but nothing about individual lives. There are artifacts that tell us something about their lives, stone tools, paintings in caves, but no permanent buildings until relatively recently, really from about 10,000 years ago. There's little sign of development through that vast stretch of time. Rather, it's as if the artifacts show the habits being consolidated over many generations. And it's speculated that, for example, the Neanderthals didn't have the sharply focused consciousness of Homo sapiens. Now, I just <laughs> pressed a button that I thought would make me scroll down the page, and it took me to the end of the document. So, let's get back there. So, until we start finding evidence of buildings, we assume that everyone was nomadic. But following on from the global warming about 10,000 years ago, there are the first traces of agricultural settlements. I might want to modify that in the light of Mark's presentation yesterday, but it's, uh, it's standard as a generalization. So, some of those settlements didn't last long, but others did, and their inhabitants would have thought of them as permanent settlements, but that transition wouldn't have been abrupt. Maybe it took 10,000 years as Mark was suggesting. Uh, presumably, the earliest settlers were guardians who protected the crops while the tribe went on its way. And maybe these guardians would expect to rejoin the travellers when they passed by again the next year. Somebody had the idea of settling in a place and staying there, and it seems to have been a relatively recent idea. There are still plenty of nomadic people in the world, so it's not as if the mode of existence has become obsolete, but it's no longer dominant, not among the people who write commentary on such things. As a global population, we've moved in the last 10,000 years from a position where settlement was extraordinarily unusual to one where it's normal, where most of the global population now lives in urban settlements, having no daily connection with agricultural production. And most of this migration into cities has taken place in the last 200 years. The rate of change in human experience has been astonishing. Even 2,500 years ago, the great cities like Athens and Sparta had much smaller populations than a modern city would have, and much more contact with basic production. Athens was unusual in devoting as much energy as it did to the production of monuments. And Thucydides, the Athenian, said that if we looked at Sparta, we would think it looked like no more than a collection of villages. And we wouldn't infer from its buildings that it was one of the great cities of the world, which of course it was, and Thucydides was saying that it was. It just didn't look like it, or its ruins wouldn't look like it. The key thing that makes cities work isn't the quality of their buildings, but their connections. The town is the correlate of the road. They connect with other settlements, but also there are connections within the settlement that form in ways that can't be sustained in a more mobile population. It becomes possible for the inhabitants to take on roles and identities that be can become highly specialised. This, this is something that all the geographers already know, probably before they even start on their geography degree. So, this is written for a wider audience than geographers. If, if I grow up in a tribe that scavenges for food, then I will have very well developed skills for recognizing the proximity of the things that I need. And we still have the instincts for that sort of thing, although we don't necessarily 
know it. We don't make use of those instincts. Uh, but, but they can be reawakened um, if, if we put ourselves in those situations. Uh, but, but they're bred in over countless generations of an evolutionary timescale. And everything else has happened much too quickly to be modified by evolution. If I grow up in a small agricultural community, then I know how to produce my own food and could do well enough most of the things that are done in the village. But if the settlement's a bit bigger, then specialisms start to appear. Someone's good at, at building or making pottery, and they can do this in exchange for food rather than directly producing the food themselves. And nowadays, we still need food, but most of us have no idea how to produce it. We just buy it. But there are also people, including ourselves, who have skills that require the support of complex networks that are urban in character. Think of all the things that have to be in place before even one person can have an income as a television presenter or a DJ, or to have a successful cafe, or, God help us, a nail bar, or a school of architecture. Now, I want to jump to an architectural example, and for this I chose one of the best known buildings of the 20th century, the Farnsworth House by Mies van der Rohe, designed in 1945 by Edith Farnsworth. And the, the reason I chose it is because it, it's such an extreme uh, reduction. It, it, it's, it's very clearly uh, segmented as an autonomous ob object, it looks like. To describe it geometrically is very straightforward because it's finely resolved in geometric terms. We can see it as a geometrically bounded object that sits in a grove of trees and it seems to offer the possibility of living almost in nature. There's shelter from a roof plane which is supported by eight columns and the walls all the way around are sheets of plate glass. So the proximity to the trees and open ground is very evident when one is in the house. It's barely more than a frame for the contemplation of nature. Any house would do for the analysis that I'm going on to, to, to make. But the point I want to make is that while it seems paired back to the minimum in this case, in some ways it is an extravagance. It's a work of obvi obvious sophistication, uh, as is instantly obvious if I contrast it with uh, Thoreau's hut at Alden Pond, which makes no attempt to accomplish anything artistically, just to put its inhabitant in close proximity to nature. And th th this is a, a building that's well known to anyone who's gone through American high school, I think. Uh, Th Thoreau's ideas about uh, being close to nature, uh, living in the woods uh, at Alden Pond, are now core curriculum. And he explains in his book, Walden, how he bought this hut cheaply, second hand, and rebuilt it on a site that had been made available to him. So the cost is negligible. The Farnsworth House, by contrast, was an expensive building. It exceeded even the estimated costs, and the client sued the architect. Uh, it, it's a fascinating story, and we can go into it today, and I'm tempted. But I want to draw out the connections that are necessary for this house to be built in the way that it was built, and to show that it's not nearly as isolated as the picture makes it seem. Not that the appearance is misleading. First, there's the question of the inhabitant and how she had the means to pay for the building. There's a flow of money into the project without which it could not have happened. It's not a building commissioned by an agricultural worker who was farming nearby land. It was a weekend house for a woman who worked in a large hospital in Chicago, an hour and a half drive away. She was a kidney specialist and had a good salary. And this is not an individual 
who could have had such an income before the 20th century. She was a woman who was not only capable of being involved in high-level medical research, but she was permitted to be. The income source was the big city, Chicago, and she reached the rural site in an automobile, which we have a picture. Um, which she was allowed to drive. Already, there's social structures in place that were not and are not universal. The house isn't isolated, but it's in agencement with the city through the flow of money and through the mechanism of the automobile. And then, we should take note of the fact that in addition to the eight columns that support the house, there is, tucked away underneath it, and not expressed, a tube that descends into the earth. And if you can just about make it out, it looks pretty much like a column, but this, this tube contains all the services of, of, of the house. It has electricity for heating and lighting, there's a water supply, and pipes take wastewater away. Normally, in a house that looks as isolated as this, the waste would be dealt with through a septic tank. But in fact, the house is quite close to the water treatment plant for the city of Plano. So it's actually connected there. And there might be... Yes, here we are. This is the water treatment plant at Plano. Uh, th this is another water treatment plant a bit further away in, in Chicago. And, and on the right, um, a, a power station uh, to, to which it's also connected. Um, so the, these are all, in effect, part of the house. They're part of the domestic assemblage. So an alternative description of the house you can see it as an assemblage of flows of energy and resources which go into sustaining a habitation, bringing together elements of powerful generating plants and channeling of resources along pipes and cables and through highways and bank accounts. It's a dynamic interaction of very specialized things which are controlled with some precision and which were available there and then in a way that would have been impossible in some other places and at some other times. So we, we can date the house with some precision just by looking at it. These things are all held in place by the building elements, which show up in the photos, and they themselves are products of industrial manufacture, which were not available in earlier ages, and not available without the transport systems that enable you to carry steel girders uh, and so on by, by truck. The steel I-beams, for example, were formed at high temperatures by colossally powerful machines and then brought to the site by truck where they were welded together and power tools were used to grind the junctions to make them visually pristine. The plate glass was formed uh, by floating the, the fluid glass on a bath of molten tin which is hot enough to keep the glass in its liquid state. So you need a, a huge apparatus to, to, to do that. It, it's a process that's way beyond the capabilities of a rural workshop to produce. But the sheets of glass can be carried long distances once the transport needs are in place. I could also add that there needs to be a, a system of uh, land ownership in place that recognises the householder's right to the sole use of the land around the dwelling. Without that, the house wouldn't work. Uh, the, these glass planes need the, the, the space outside to be private in order for the house to have privacy. And in fact, that was one of the ways in which it, it one of the many ways in which it broke down, because the house became so famous that sightseers intruded on the occupant's privacy. Uh, she would wake up in the morning, go to the bathroom in her, in her room, and find people taking photographs of her through the club. Uh, that, this is part of the case against the architect of the court. Uh, the development of an ur urban environment makes it possible for a society to do new things, to live in ways that are remote from agriculture. 
We might still go foraging for sustenance, but the activity is pursued in a media of other people, buildings, waste, consumption, where there's a great richness of ideas and conversational opportunity. In a city, we expect to buy food in shops, have it delivered, or eat in tavernas. City dwellers don't usually themselves grow a substantial part of the food they eat, nor do they typically make their own clothes or their own dwellings. Sorry, the, the computer's just done another jump. But the, the, the general point that I'm making is the, the one that Adam Smith made in The, the, the Wealth of Nations, that specialisation produces efficiency and uh, increases the, <coughs> the division of labour in, increases the, the, the productivity. Uh, Then there are the businesses that deal, in, in the city, there's businesses that deal not only with practical things, but legal matters, high finance. The, the assemblage of people with different skill sets makes it possible to produce clothes in a factory or ideas in a university, and these assemblages are taken apart and reconstituted routinely every day when people go home and do domestic things or sociable things in public places and then return to the workplace. They're taken apart and reconstituted in different ways during the course of a life. The secondarity in the move from school to the workplace. You're not at home anymore, the army tells us. Says to the, these groupings, assemblages, are intermittent for the individual. We participate intermittently for a while and then move on to something else. But they could be sustained over centuries if there's a need for them. They're assembled from elements that include parts of our capacity to act, and they're assembled with cause and effect like geometry or politics. So there is in their fluid, fluid comings and goings a certain stability, an emergent form of sorts. They are dissipative systems like whirlwinds, and they're constituted. And while they are constituted, they can start to be treated as entities even when they are nothing but flows of digital information. There are digital objects which cannot be pinned down. The fluid overlapping communities and groupings of city life are the analog versions of the interactions that have been supplemented but not displaced by digital information flows. The only thing that prevents these assemblages turning from objects into subjects is our inability to empathize with them as they don't have consciousness and don't seem to be acting with a sense of volition. And, and this I, I put in because it's uh, a, an image of the, the collective taking, uh, be, being turned into uh, a thinking subject, the, the, the state turning into the subject. It, it's the, the, the frontispiece from Thomas Hobbes's Le Le Leviathan. And, I don't know if you can see the detail, but the, the body of the monarch is a crowd of, of, of people. Uh, there's d dozens, millions of people depicted in there, but they're supposedly represented and given wise governance by, by, by the, the, the monarch, who uh, is seen to translate the collectivity into a consciousness that can be articulated. And I, I, I want to link that in, in some sort of way with um, uh, James Scott uh, seeing like a state, uh, the, the state becomes the subject and the swarms of citizens become something like matter that has propensities and valences. The populace can be thought about as a complex material that has chemical or geological properties. This kind of empathy might be held in check by the fact that the kind of consciousness that we directly know <coughs> remains at the human scale and can have a regulating effect. But there's many cases around where large corporations seem to be prepared to let their commercial interests overrule any sense of humanity's wider interests. That's exactly what was being discussed just 
just before, the, the, the sense that what's really going in the, on in the corporation is at the level of the disaffectedness in, in, in the office, and not worrying about the, the wider effects on humanity. But it means that the corporation ends up reducing not only us, but the world to its use value, and it acts so as to maximize its profits, not for reasons of individual greed, but because it's systematically bound to do so. The profits have to be good so the investors stay on board, and the investors are often themselves corporate bodies, like pension funds that are needed to provide sustenance to the elderly. There's an implacable logic to the processes involved, and they're not human, not subject to regulation by human feeling. There's a danger that the state is too often learning to see like a corporation, and that architecture can all too easily respond to corporate values rather than human values. A city can seem to be a large and its overlapping assemblages make it more complex than a corporation. Not everyone who lives in a city or who engages with it and leaves again will want the same things from it. Scaling up to the larger cities with millions of inhabitants, we might feel lost and doubt that the place has any coherence or unifying identity at all. But then, if the millions of microbes that inhabit our bodies had consciousness, they would feel that they were in very different places if they found themselves at my finger ends or in my liver, and they'd be wholly unaware of my conscious thought. Consciousness remains with the human, and if we are drawn to the city, it's because it offers us something, intellectual stimulation, the hope of a higher income, sociability, access to power. We might find it impossible to say what it is that draws us there, but the city does draw us there. We've reached a point where even the furthest depths of the countryside function as parts of the city assemblage. Where crops are grown, they grow to feed urban populations. Only an insignificant portion remains near the farm to feed the agricultural workers, who are most likely to buy most of their food in the shops, like everyone else. A rural idyll, like the Farnsworth House, is functionally an urban building depending on money from the city, and acting as a retreat from the city. If it's part of the local economy, it's as a place where money is spent, not a place where wealth is produced. And it's in connection with cities that we expect to find the new ways of life being worked out. The urban media has in it not only the flow of nutrition and spaces of shelter, but other people and their ideas. So we make temporary assemblages through the day with things in the city and things that have come into it, including ideas from our neighbours and long ago and far away picked up from reading and conversation. There are no hard edges and people and concepts come and go, sometimes caught up in circuits that for a while at least seem stable. Concepts need people if they're to survive and reproduce. And urban media are the great, if almost accidental, breeding grounds for concepts and experimentation. Thank you.